Yes, ma'am. Oh, hey, we can do that. That song we just sang? Hey, we can do that. That's a great prayer, isn't it? All right, tell you what, I'll get the words of that sometime within the next six months. And uh, <laughs> No, I'm, te- <laughs> I'm teasing. Sister. Hey, you'll have to remind me, not that I ever forget anything, but you know how I am. And, and Miss Nancy's not here this morning. They're in Kentucky seeing their son. You'd be praying for them. But, uh, honey, if you'll help me remember that. All right, thank you very much, sister. I thought you was raising your hand saying we need to send a preacher on to Hawaii vacation. Man, uh, nah. Luke chapter 13. We're going through the book of the Luke book of Luke on Sunday mornings <clears throat> wanting to become more like him realizing that our faith is in Christ alone look our faith is not in the church all right our faith is in Jesus Christ that's where it ought to be our, our faith is not in our good works all right all of our righteousnesses are as what? Filthy rags. So I can't put any faith there. Uh, our faith is to be in Christ alone. Now, I have some faith in you. In, in other words, I have good faith in you. You're, you're all right, people. But my faith is not in you, right? Faith is in Christ alone. And by the way, your faith should not be in me. Uh, I'll let you down. I don't know, amens there? Praise the Lord. I thought for sure there'd be a, a rowdy amen there. I'll let you down. I'm just a man. Your faith is to be in Christ alone. So we're going through the book of Luke, studying Christ, the things he said, the things he did. Now we're at chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. Let's all stand, please, and, and I'll read you. Follow along. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. Father, we thank you for your word. Give us hearts and minds that are open to understand and receive and obey your word. Holy Spirit, work in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says that there were present at this season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. What a horrible thing here. The the children of Israel, they were under the rule of Rome at this time. Pilate was over this particular region. And Pilate had sent some soldiers or, or some men Some say it was stealthily, some say just an armed group that was not stealthily. And that while some of those from Galilee were there at the the temple offering their sacrifices, these men of Pilate's came in to the tabernacle, which meant to the Jews that, that wasn't permitted. These were Gentile men, but they stormed in. They killed these Galileans, and they mingled their blood with the blood of the sacrifices. What a tragedy. Man, what a thing to, uh, uh, to cause the Jews to be really upset. You know, and, and now they bring this to Jesus as he's been teaching them. Say, hey, G- did you hear about what happened? To, you're, you're from Galilee. You're a Galilean. Did you hear about those Galileans that were over here offering their sacrifice and Pilate had them killed and mingled their blood with the blood of the sacrifices? 
You know, we always find it disturbing when something bad happens in our society, don't we? We often wonder, well, whose fault is it? Now, in ancient times, the people would often attribute the events uh, uh, of something bad happened to somebody, they would attribute that to the judgment of God. Now there are those in our day who when something happens, they blame God, declaring, boy, he's unkind or unfair or unjust. Yet there's some today, just like those in ancient time, that whenever someone suffers a tragedy, they immediately, immediately declare what's the judgment of God for some wrongdoing on the part of those involved. Now, this supposition perhaps is what leads some in this situation to bring up the event that happened to the Galileans in this passage. Someone tells Jesus of the death of these Galileans at the hand of Pilate. As I said, he had a group of Galileans killed at the temple. And now these that are at Jesus' feet are wanting an assessment of this event. It may have also been another attempt to entrap Jesus with his words. Hey, did you hear what Pilate did? And maybe they were hoping he would speak out against Pilate, knowing then that they could go and tell Pilate, and have harm done to Christ. It is easy to focus our attention on the lives and faults of others rather than on ourself, isn't it? Jesus in this passage turns the focus back onto the individual. He takes their public assumptions and turns them into an opportunity for public reflection. Now I want you to picture here as Jesus has been teaching and they bring this up and maybe some are trying to entrap him. Maybe some are trying to say, boy, those were some wicked people for that to happen to. Have you ever known someone like that that any time something bad happens to someone, they say, oh, they must not be doing right. I mean, sir, have you ever been running through the house and stub your pinky toe? You ever do that? Man, that's one of the worst things that happens in my life. That's painful. Fall down, my whole body reacts. I grab my toe, I roll around, I start grunting. Uh, uh, and my wife runs into the hallway and she says, Yep, I knew you hadn't been tithing. I'm there laying on the ground. She said, Oh, I, I, I could tell you haven't been reading your Bible, have you? You must not be praying. She doesn't really do this. She's looking at me like, I do. She well, that would be absurd, wouldn't it? I got a speeding ticket. Oh, you must not be living for God. No, I was speeding. That's why I got a speeding ticket. We have this, this tendency sometimes as Christians when something negative happens to somebody to automatically assume what must be the judgment of God. Oh, my transmission went out. Well, have you been tithing? Yes, I just didn't check my transmission fluid, maybe. Oh, I blew, I blew the head gasket on my engine. Well, have you been reading your Bible? You see, the two don't always go hand in hand, folks. Just because something bad happens doesn't mean it's always the judgment of God. And before the people get lost in all the possibilities of why this could have happened, this terrible, tragic event, why it could have happened to these Galileans, he takes it and he personalizes it. Look at what he says in verse number 3. I tell you, nay, that means no, an emphatic no. Nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. In verse 2, he was saying that, he had just said, look, do you suppose that this happened because they were more wicked than anybody else in the area? No. And then he turns it on the people themselves. He says, and except you repent, you'll perish as well. Repentance. What is repentance? The Bible definition of repentance is simply this, to change one's mind. Remember, the Jews relied on keeping the law to save them. 
they relied on, well, if I, if I go to the, the temple and I offer these sacrifices and I keep all these commandments, then I will be able to have that eternal life. But here's the problem. It's an impossibility to keep all the commandments. Nobody could, there's only one who's ever done that. You know who it was? No, it was not Chuck Norris. It was Jesus Christ. And so the Jewish mindset, look, they have this mindset of, look, we, we are children of Abraham. As a matter of fact, Jesus rebukes them one time in Matthew 3, 9 when he says, and think not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. The Jews were a proud people. We have Abraham as our father and, and we've been given the oracles of God and we are God's children and we have his commandments. So as long as we do A, B, C and one, two, three and, and then we'll be fine. And Jesus now is addressing them in this context saying, no, you must repent. Sometimes in and, and regards to salvation, he's saying you're going to have to change your mind it's not what all can I do to be saved. It is what Christ has done so that we can be saved. See, our only way to heaven, it's not by going to church. In just a little bit, we'll observe the Lord's Supper. Let me tell you something. That will not get you one centimeter closer to heaven. All right? The only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. And these Jews, they were trusting, they're looking towards their law and towards their religious leaders and towards their sacrifices and, and all these do's and don'ts saying, well, if I do these things, I can get to heaven. There's been many people I've met, I'd say, well, if you died right now, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? Well, I hope so. Well, I, I'm kind of, I do good and I treat people nice and, you know, I, I, I feed people, I give people money and, and I'm kind to everybody. That's the same thing the Jews thought. They thought, well, we're God's children and, and we're doing all these things. And Jesus said, no, you must repent. Turn from that way of thinking and turn to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So he takes this event here. When the people are wanting to know, they're speculating about, well, were those people wicked? And, and all. he said, no, listen, listen, listen. That's not the focus. The focus here right now is you. And except you repent, you shall uh, also perish. Sometimes even after salvation, there is a, a cause for repentance, a change of mind. Listen, Revelation 2.5. Remember, as Jesus uh, uh, has given letters to some of the churches, remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. These were saved people he was talking to. But now they had, at, at the first man, they served God, and they served him with a heart of love and, and a heart of passion. But somewhere along the way, they had cooled off now. And now they're just going through the, the phases. And he says, listen, you need to repent and go back to where you were. They had taken their focus off of, of their heart relationship with Christ. And now their focus was back on the do's and don'ts. The crowds asked this question. Have you heard about this Christ, Jesus? Now the Jews of the first century were persecuted by the Romans and of course this is another story of Roman cruelty if Jesus sides with the Galileans he could be entrapped there was some faulty thinking in this question they thought that if as I said earlier if something bad happened to someone then it must be the result of punishment we see this same mindset in John 9 2 when they see this blind man Jesus and his disciples and the disciples say this Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? So here's a blind man. He's been blind since birth. And the, uh, the disciples, their first thought is, well, he or his parents must have sinned. This must be the judgment of God. You go on to read that passage, though, you'll find out it wasn't God's judgment. It was for God's glory that God had allowed that man to be blind. And he healed him. 
It's the same mindset we see in the reaction of Job's friends to his calamity. Job's friends, after Job had lost everything, Job's friends go and they sit down before him. For three days they don't say anything, they just look at him. When they finally talk, listen to what Eliphaz, the Temanite, a friend of Job, says, Remember, I pray thee, whoever perished being innocent, or where were the righteous cut off? He's saying, Job, you know there's some secret sin of yours, and that's why this is happening. That's not why it was happening. God was allowing it to happen to prove Job, to test Job, to strengthen Job's faith. Look, every bad thing that comes into your life is not really bad. Sometimes some things come into your life that look bad that are actually for your good. How many of you in here had surgery? Well, there's, you know what, you say, there's nothing good about being cut open. I don't care for what reason it is. I mean, that's just not a good thing. Here, let me cut you open. But there's a good result when the problem inside is fixed, right? So not everything that hurts is a bad thing. The mindset is seen, once again, in the, the, the reaction of Job's friends to his calamity. When someone suffers calamity, look, the right reaction on our part is not to be one of judgment. Oh, well, I wonder what they're doing wrong. Well, that wouldn't have happened to them if they were walking with God. That's not the right, the, the right mindset. The right mindset, however, is compassion. Even if it is judgment. Sometimes we'll be going down the road, see somebody pulled over. One of my sons will say, oh, he got him someone. Almost with excitement. When I see it, my heart sinks because I know how he feels. I've been there recently. The ticket got dismissed, by the way, praise the Lord. I just walked in there and he said, why were you doing this? I said, sir, I'm not under law, I'm under grace. (laughs) He said, you're going to have to pay this fine. And I started singing, Jesus paid it all. No, it didn't really go like that, folks. Just showing where I corrected the problem. But they'll, they'll say, well, look, he got him someone. But and so I was like, man, bless their heart. I did this just recently. I think maybe Carson was with me. I said, bless their heart. And he said, what do you mean? I said, man, I know how that feels. Man, he's going to have to pay him a fine. And he'd probably get insurance, uh, points against his insurance. His, his insurance might go up. Man, I, I don't rejoice that that guy got pulled over. My good, He may have deserved it and the officer doing his job, but our mindset instead of judgment should be one of compassion. As a Christian, it is our place to love and have compassion. And we see in verse 3 now Jesus' answer where he says, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Jesus takes this situation out of the political realm and he brings it right into the personal realm. He turns the thoughts of their people from others. Now he turns their thoughts back on themselves. And he's saying basically, listen, this this situation here where Pilate had these Galileans slain, yes, that was terrible, but, but but it's not about Pilate. And it's not about the Galileans that you ought to be worried. It's about you. I wonder how many less problems we would have if we would worry about our own problems instead of everybody else's. Right? I wonder how much nicer our life would be if we would try to fix our own selves before we fixed everybody else. They presumed falsely, these people did. And he tells them, nay, absolutely not. This is not why it happened. In Isaiah 64, 6, listen to what the prophet says. But we are all as an unclean thing. And all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And we all do fade as a leaf. 
and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. He's saying, listen, we're all in the same boat together. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, the Bible says it this way, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He's basically telling them, listen, those that died in the temple did not die that kind of death because they were worse than you. He gives them an illustration in verse number 4. Look what he says. Or those 18, he tells of another tragedy. Or those 18 upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them. Think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem. There was a, in a town of Siloam, they were building a tower and it collapsed, fell, killed 18 of those men. And he said, now, look, just like this situation, you're wondering if this happened because these people were wicked. Do you think these died because they were more wicked than all of y'all? No, the, the, <clears throat> he's refuting the idea that bad things only happen to bad people. There's a, a, a more fundamental issue here, and that fundamental issue is them and their own sin. The time and method of death is not what's to be focused on, Jesus is saying. The focus is this. We're all going to die. Are you ready? Look, everybody in here, lest the Lord come, is one day going to take a final breath, and you don't know when it will be. Miss recently, we buried Miss Isabel, 90 years old. Early this week, went to a funeral of a, I think, was she, was she 19? 18, of an 18-year-old girl, student at Southern Wayne. Look, you don't know <clears throat> when you're going to draw that last breath. Well, preacher, this sermon's a downer. Well, wait, it don't have to be. I'll get to the end. But the simple fact is, we all have this in common. We're all going to die one day. And these people now, they're saying to Jesus, hey, what about them? And Jesus is saying, look, that's not the issue. How they died, when they died, where they died, that's not the issue. The issue is this, you, and the same thing's going to happen to you. Are you ready? What is important is that while we live, we turn to Christ, Trust Him as Savior. Listen, that is the most important decision in our lives, isn't it? To trust Christ as Savior. By offering this second scenario of those that died when this tower fell, He's not allowing this question to get off track. He's once again reaffirming that, look, these situations, these circumstances, these tragedies, those are not what you need to focus on. It is you you must focus on. In Acts 3.19, he says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. A present day question some would ask similar to this, when you're giving the gospel to them, I've had people do this, be in the middle of sharing the gospel, tell them about Christ and how we're all sinners and because of our sin we all deserve to die and go to hell. But Jesus paid the price and all we've got to do is accept Christ as Savior and right in the middle of all that they'll say, hey, but I've got a question. What about those people over in the jungles that have never heard? You know what? My God is big enough and has enough love and compassion that I know he can take care of that. But right now, let's deal with you. Okay. Right now, the important question is not what about those in the deep, dark jungles that have never heard. No, right now, the question is you have heard. So what choice are you going to make? You have heard to whom much is given, much is required. These questions are often done in an effort to deflect personal responsibility. Any of you that have children probably have experienced this. When they say, hey, mom, dad, 
can I do such and such? And you say, no. And they say, but so and so does it. And their parents get to do this. Any, any parents feel me right there? You been there? Okay. But if so and so was in my house and did it, so and so would get a spanking also. We try to deflect this personal responsibility, shift it somewhere else. But listen, Jesus brings it right back to them. Nay, except you repent. Except you change your mind about how to get to heaven. Except you turn from the law and turn to the Savior, you're going to likewise, you're going to die too. Are you ready for it? Only repentance, this turning to Christ for salvation can change death from a tragic end and entrance uh, uh, to life eternal with the Father. That's the only thing. Only Jesus Christ can take that death and, and change it from something that is tragic to something that is hopeful. Done many funerals, and boy, when you're uh, uh, performing or, or conducting the funeral of someone who, uh, who, I mean, they have a solid reputation and testimony of having trusted Christ, Sometimes it's almost, it's, it's, it's strange. It mixed in with the sadness. There's a gladness and a joy and a hope. There's been once, maybe twice, I've, I've conducted the funeral of someone whom the family said, no, they, they never made any profession of all, at all of being a Christian. They, they didn't even like Christianity. And let me tell you something. That was a morbid funeral. It was a tragic thing. There was all kinds of sadness, and there was absolutely no hope. None. And it, well, how, what makes the difference? Listen, there's only one that makes the difference. That is Jesus Christ. Him. Look, in Christ alone. That's our theme for this year. In Christ alone. That's what Christ is saying here. Listen, you're trusting in all these things. No, you need to repent from that. That's not going to take you to heaven. Turn to Christ. All must come to this place in their life in order to be saved. Romans 2.11 says, For there is no respect of persons with God. Listen, he wants everyone to turn to Christ. Everyone must repent. If you do not see yourself as a sinner, you'll not see your, uh, your need to repent, to turn to Christ and Him alone. Romans 3, 9 through 10, what then? Are we better than they? This is Paul. He's telling those Jews in Rome, he, the, the, uh, look, you're no better than the Gentiles. What then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. And Jesus is driving this home in this passage. He's saying, listen, all of us, all of you must repent. John Newton said this, you know the man he wrote, Amazing grace, he had been a slave trader, lived a wicked lifestyle, trusted Christ as his Savior. And here's what he said about him and Jesus. I am a great sinner, and Jesus is a great Savior. Acts chapter 20, verse 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. There's got to be a time in your life in order to go to heaven that you turn to Christ and Christ alone. Some will say, well, I've, I've, always, I've always believed in Christ and I, I understand that growing up, I've always believed there was a Christ but I didn't believe I was going to heaven just because of Him. Growing up, if, if you would have asked me, why are you going to heaven? I would have told you, oh, because of Jesus. But in my heart of hearts, it was also because, well, I'm a good kid. I don't get in too much trouble. I, I get good grades, and, and I go to church whenever my parents do. And I've been baptized a whole bunch of times, and I had. I thought it was fun. When I went to a church, and I was doing baptism. Well, I, I grew up in a church, uh, 
I think it was Presbyterian Church, and every time they'd go up there to do that sprinkling, man, me and my pawpaw, we'd go up there. Okay? I thought it was fun. Listen, that wasn't going to get me to heaven, though. As a 13-year-old boy, I realized, you know what, it's not about any of that. My faith must be in Christ and Christ alone. Preacher, if you died, where do you think you're going? Well, I, I know where I'm going. I'm going to heaven. How can you know that? Because I'm trusting in the only one who can get me there, Jesus Christ. And he promised, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, listen to this terminology, shall be saved. That's a promise. That's a promise. Jesus, now he makes a call to the crowd in verses 6 through 9. He says this, he, he, speak, he spake also this parable, a certain man had a fig tree and planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon, and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of, the, of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this tree, and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year, also till I dig, shall dig about it, and dung it. And if it bear fruit well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. This is a parable he's speaking, a, a story uh, uh, to represent a heavenly meaning. He's basically saying this, God the Father is the, the, the uh, owner of the fig tree. He comes to the fig tree. The fig tree often represents Israel in the Bible. And he says, for three years I've come. This thing has uh, showed no sign of fruit. Cut it down. The keeper of the vineyard, he says, Lord, could I, could you just give me one more year? If I could dig about it, uh, about it, I'll dung it, I'll fertilize it. And if next year, if there's no fruit, then look, we'll cut it down. It's a picture of God's long-suffering and his mercy. He's saying, look, for, for all these years, you, the nation of Israel, you've had, you, God sent you prophets, he's given you his word, he's been waiting for you to turn to him, but you're stiff-necked and you're hard-hearted and hard-headed and you keep trusting in, in doing things your own way and he's been merciful, but the mercy's going to run out. He's going to cut you down. Judgment's going to come, and it did in 70 A.D., when Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans. In John 15, 16, he says this, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go forth and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. He said, man, I've invested my word in you, and I've not seen it come back with any fruit at all. You've not turned to the true God. and You'll be punished for that. In verse 8, we find, as I said, the long-suffering patience and mercy of God. And let me tell you something. He's a merciful God, isn't he? Well, I, look, I know some of the stories here. I, I got saved when I was young. I trusted Christ when I was young, 13-year-old man, young, young man. I know some of you did not trust Christ. Brother Rice, how old were you when you first trusted Christ? 29 years old and lived a pretty rough life. People that I meet that know him from back then, well, I'll tell them where I go to church, and I'm the pastor, and they'll say, oh, that's where John Charles goes. When they say John Charles, I'll know that's an old acquaintance. I'll say, yeah, and they'll say, boy, the Lord's really done something in his life. He was a bad dude. God was merciful to you, wasn't he, brother? Right. How many of you here, some of you that lived a pretty rough life before, you think back and you could honestly say, boy, you know what? I shouldn't even be alive right now. Anybody like that? My dad used to tell me, he'd say, son, I shouldn't be alive. Some of the things I did, some of the things I was involved in, and the situations I put myself in, I should be dead. But God allowed me to live to help raise you. You know what my dad was saying? He was saying, even when I was lost without Christ, he was long-suffering and merciful to me. Boy, don't we have a long-suffering and merciful God? Hey, listen. I, I trusted Christ when I was 13 years old. I, I still shouldn't be alive. It's because I'm a bonehead. 
God should have struck me down years ago. He's long-suffering. And he's merciful. And let me say, if you're in here and there has never been a time in your life that you've trusted Christ as Savior, listen, don't put it off another day. Don't put it off another day. Well, preacher, I'm good. There is none good. The Bible says, I want to compare ourselves against God, but don't put it off another day. Trust in Christ today. Maybe you are saved. Man, you've drifted away. You, you, I don't know what happened. Maybe you, you just got down, discouraged or whatever, but you drifted away from the Lord, and now you're not living for him like you know you should. Listen, don't let another day go by without turning you turning your heart back to him and saying, okay, look, Lord, I, I'm your child and I'm not living like your child. Lord, I'm coming back to you. I want to walk with you. In 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any perish, but that all should come to repentance. He says, I don't want any, anybody to go to hell. He says, I want, I want everybody to turn to Christ. In John 14, 1 through 3, he says, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. He wants that to be true for everyone. And the only way it can be is if we turn to Christ in faith. Listen here, I want to conclude because we're going to have the Lord's Supper here in a minute. I'll leave you just a couple points. Number one, every one of us has a personal responsibility before God. Listen to this verse in Romans 14, 12. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God of himself. Well, look, we're going to stand before God one day, every one of us, and we'll not be able to say, oh, but, but Lord, I would have done a lot better if it weren't for Miss Head. Lord, you know she just got on my nerves and, and, and frustrated. <laughs> just teasing, teasing Miss Head. Yeah, Lord, I, I, I can't point at Miss Head. Well, Lord, if my dad had done that, if my mom had done that, look, if you've sat under the sound of the gospel and, and you've read the gospel, you know the gospel, that the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ, then now you are responsible for that. And if you're saved, you've trusted Christ as Savior, you're his child and you're living for him, you're walking with him, should not be dependent on anyone else. You have a choice to make. Am I going to walk with him or not? We all have a personal responsibility before God. And listen, we've been given a whole lot. We read this verse last week, but he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much of him, they will ask the more. Listen, we live in America. We live in the Bible Belt. Many of us have sat under the preaching of God's Word for years. We've, we, several of us, uh, many of us probably, have multiple copies of God's Word. My children, sometimes they would have a Bible that they kept at the school, a Bible they kept at the church, a Bible they kept in the car, and a Bible they kept at the house because they didn't want to tire themselves out by carrying it. Wherever they went, there was a Bible. I, I, I remember I've taken some home before. I'd see a Bible. Oh, my son left his Bible. Take it home. Dad, why'd you bring that home? It's like, it's your Bible. I said, That's my church Bible. I leave it there so I can make sure I never go and forget one. <laughs> That's called laziness. Or they may call it smart. Listen, we've been given a lot. Are we living up to the opportunities and the privileges we've been given, folks? Well, preacher, but I, I, I hear what you're saying, but let me tell you about so-and-so. No, 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 it's not about so-and-so. But do you know what I saw them doing? It's not about what you saw them doing. But do you know what they said? 
No, it's not about what they said. It's about you. And it's about your personal relationship with the Lord and your personal walk with the Lord. Everybody bow your head and close your eyes.